Welcome to Write With Love. I'm your host, Sarah Williams, best-selling author, speaker, and creative entrepreneur. Each week, I chat to passionate and inspiring authors about their journey in creative writing. Some are traditionally published, some do it themselves. Everyone's journey is different, and everyone has something interesting to say. We all love love and love what we do. Today's show is brought to you by our amazing fans and supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the show and get some awesome bonus episodes, go to patreon.com forward slash Sarah Williams author to learn more. Now here's today's show. G'day, g'day. I'm Sarah Williams. Thanks for joining me for episode 44 of Write With Love. I'm recording this on Friday the 19th of October 2018 during a break in the weather. It has been raining constantly for about three weeks and we are growing mold. My poor horse is stuck in her muddy paddock and is not happy at all. So I have a few things to tell you about today. First up, nominations for OzRom Today Awards are now open. Last year, I was nominated for Best New Author of 2017, which was very cool. Thank you. This year, the Reader's Choice categories are Best New Author, Best Established Author, Author of the Year, Cover of the Year, and Book of the Year. You can nominate in multiple categories, but the authors must be Australian. The website is AUSROM. T-O-D-A-Y dot com. Also, the Australian Romance Readers Association are hosting three, possibly four, author signing events in March 2019. And reader tickets are on sale now for A Romantic Rendezvous. The locations and dates are Brisbane, 23rd of March 2019. Sydney, 24th of March 2019. Melbourne's the 30th of March 2019 and Perth, if they get the numbers, will be the 31st of March 2019. I will be at the Brisbane signing and would love to see you there. I will have lots of goodies and freebies for you and if you're a patron you can claim your free hug. The website to book is australianromancereaders.wordpress.com Just a reminder that I have two books available on pre-order at the moment. The Dairy Farmer's Daughter, the first in my new Heart of the Hinterland series, is out 28th November 2018. And you can order that at books2read.com forward slash The Dairy Farmer's Daughter. And check out the 30 second book trailer on my website, YouTube and social media. Do you love Australian rural romance? Annie Seaton, Suzanne Bellamy, S.E. Gilchrist, Anne B. Harrison, S.M. Spencer, Philippa Neffrey Clark and I have joined forces for a combined Kindle-only box set. Outback Hearts is a compilation of six of our favourite full-length novels and one new short story and is available now to pre-order for 99 cents. It will be live on Amazon on December 1st for three months. So check it out. And if you would like to join me here in the beautiful Mullaney hinterland, I am hosting a writer's retreat from May 31st till June 3rd, 2019. All the details are on my page, which is sarahwilliamsauthor.com forward slash Mullaney, M-A-L-E-N-Y dash writers dash retreat. We will be writing, talking craft and having fun. I will also show you all the steps involved in uploading a manuscript to distributors and how to professionally self-publish. Shout out today to Renee Dahlia, author of The Heart of a Blue Stocking, which is now available to buy. Here's the blurb. When an uncommon lawyer meets an unusual doctor, their story must be extraordinary. September 1888. Dr. Claire Carlingford owns the blue stocking label. Her tycoon father encouraged her to study and with the support of her best friends, she took it further than anyone could imagine, graduating as a doctor and running her own medical practice. But it's not enough for her father. He wants her to take over the business so he can retire. 
Then his sudden arrest throws the family into chaos and his business into peril. Mr. James Ravi Howick, second son of Lord Darlinge, wants to use his position as a lawyer to improve conditions for his mother's family in India. When an opportunity arises to work for Carlingford Enterprises, one of the richest companies in the world, Ravi leaps at the chance to open his own legal practice. But his employment becomes personal as he spends more time with Claire and she learns a secret that could destroy his family. Both Ravi and Claire are used to being outsiders and alone. But as they work together to save their respective families from disaster, it becomes clear that these two misfits might just fit together perfectly. Learn more about Renee at ReneeDahlia.com. That's R-E-N-E-E-D-A-H-L-I-A.com. And if you are an author who would like a shout out on the show for as little as $25, send an email to sarah at serenadepublishing.com or become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Sarah Williams Author for more information. Next week I'm chatting to T.M. Clark who writes both for children and adults and is truly extraordinary. Today I'm talking to Pamela Freeman but you might know her as Pamela Hart. She is the author of historical novels such as The Desert Nurse and a teacher at the Australian Writers' Centre. Thanks for joining me today and enjoy the interview. G'day and welcome to Write With Love. Today I'm chatting to the very talented Pamela Freeman who also writes as Pamela Hart. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks Sarah, it's lovely to be here. Excellent. So you've got a very interesting story and I'd love for you to share that with us. Um, well, I started as a children's scriptwriter with ABC Kids. So I went from the Powerhouse Museum where I was doing the little videos that go along with the exhibits to ABC and I was a researcher and scriptwriter there for quite a few years. And while I was there I started writing stories for children Um So I came to prose writing quite late. You know, I'd always wanted to be a writer, but as a young person, I wrote poetry and didn't and fan fiction, um, and didn't really get into my own stories until my late twenties. And so I started writing children's fiction then. Um, And then later on, I had an idea. Some of that fiction was fantasy. and later on I had an idea for an adult fantasy series, the Castings Trilogy, um, and did that. And, you know, I've been writing in a lot of genres for kids, uh, and one of those was historical fiction with the black dress, and that started my interest in historical fiction. Um, but then I started writing for adults with historical fiction because I wanted to tell the story associated with my grandfather who was at Gallipoli yeah. um, and that was my first adult historical fiction book The Soldier's Wife and that was that's p- partly based on his life. Yeah wow well, that's really interesting so you also uh, got a doctor of creative arts so yeah. you, you would have spent a lot of time at university. <laughs> um, well actually a doctor you don't actually spend a lot of time at uni you go in once a month for a meeting with your supervisor but pretty much you're on your own. Um, <laughs> I, I did that doctorate for two reasons three reasons I guess one was that um, I wanted to start that uh, epic fantasy novel And that was my first time writing for adults. And I was a bit, you know, can I do it? Do I need help to do it? That sort of thing. And so doing it as my thesis, my Mm -hmm. first, uh, the first book in that fantasy trilogy was my thesis, Blood Ties. Um, That gave me the support and guidance. I had Deborah Adelaide as my supervisor, who was a wonderful writer and editor herself. Um, and I learned a lot about writing for adults from her. Mm. So that was the main reason I did it. And then I was at home with a little toddler and um, I'd given up my consultancy work, which I had done hand in hand with writing before I got married. And we just needed a little bit of money, frankly. And <laughs> so the scholarship came in really handy. You know, I wouldn't have done it just for that, but it was it was very helpful. Um, And also the great thing about being a doctor 
is when somebody says to you, is it Miss or Mrs.? You go, it's Dr. Agnes. <laughs> that's, that's the lasting benefit of having it, frankly. <laughs> that would be. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. So, um, yeah, let's talk about your book. So it started with this Mary McKillop story called The Black Dress. Yes. So, um, so that... Mary, Mary McKillop has just been named a saint, an Australian saint, a couple of years ago, in case there's anyone outside of Australia who didn't know that. Um, so, yeah, tell us that story. Well, in a way, the, the fact that she's a saint is the least interesting part about her. Um, she was an extraordinary woman. I mean, she got excommunicated because she wouldn't bow down to the bishops, basically. Um, so she was somebody who said, oh, yes, I absolutely believe in the authority of the church, but, the, you know, the bishops don't really understand what God wants me to do. <laughs> uh, and, um, so she was an incredibly interesting, strong woman in the 1860 she started her work at a time when there was almost no free education mm -hmm. and she started free education in Australia um, and set up a system of schools right across Australia and New Zealand uh, and she was an extraordinary person, incredibly charismatic. Um, the bishops hated her. I mean, she was, they, they seeked the Inquisition on her three times and three times she came out unscathed because they couldn't find anything, you know. Mm. Um, but she was an extraordinary person and uh, it, was the, it was the hardest book I've ever written. It took me five and a half years mm. because I was conscious that it was a very important book to some people, yeah. you know. Um, but also just finding the voice was very hard. So I, I wrote it five times. I threw out four complete uh, approaches to it, changed the narrative position five times, you know. Um, w so it was hard. Yeah. <laughs> Worth it, you know, I mean, it won the New South Wales Premier's History Prize, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly a better book because I threw out all the early drafts. Yeah, yeah, yeah you do learn a lot writing that first draft. Eh? <laughs> oh, yes. So, um, so it was hard finding the right voice that would connect with people now. Yeah. Given that it's a historical person, a real person, mm. and she's a saint. There's yeah. a kind of distance between us and her, and bridging that distance was quite difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So the next one that you wrote, like you were saying, um, is based uh, on the Anzacs in Gallipoli. So tell us a That's bit about right. that. Mm. Well, we don't actually go to Gallipoli. Um, it's called The Soldier's Wife yeah. and I'm showing it to you now. Excellent. And it is beautiful. It's really it is gorgeous. It's beautiful, isn't mm. it? Um, my grandfather was wounded at Gallipoli. He was one of the, the last people out and was wounded in the retreat. Um, and I was looking at the telegrams that the family received after he was wounded because he was he had a, a shrapnel shell burst near him and he had lots of pieces of shrapnel in him mm. and he was taken to Alexandria on the hospital ship and then to Cairo and he became very ill and the family got a series of telegrams saying you know regret report brother because he was an orphan so it went to his sister regret report brother private Arthur Freeman wounded mm. and then the next one said regret report seriously ill and then dangerously ill, mm -hmm. and then still dangerously ill, and finally about a month afterwards out of danger. <laughs> and reading these over, I see what would it be like to be the person who got that series of telegrams, and that's really where the idea of the soldier's wife came from. Mm -hmm. So it's about the woman who got gets those telegrams, wow. and it's her husband, obviously, instead of her brother. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then the second half of the book is after he comes home. Yeah. And he's wounded, he can't work, he has a bit of PTSD um, and it's about how that relationship is affected by the war. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Excellent. So um, that kind of all sparked your, your love for historical fiction. So what came next? <laughs> well, every time I did a, I, every time I did the research for one, mm. I found a story for the next one. <laughs> um, so the next one was The War Bride. Um, which is also a cover I love, yeah. love all these covers. But um, when I was doing the research for The Soldier's Wife, I found this fantastic book called Bride of an Anzac, 
which was written as an autobiography by a 95-year-old woman, uh, Queenie Sunderland. She eventually died at like 103 or something. She's <laughs> an extraordinary person. And she had met and married her Tom in England. <laughs> was working at Reading Station and she met he was you know working for the Australian transport part of the war and um and she came out here as the bride of an Anzac and in that there's this scene where on the deck of the ship her friend Margaret that she's become friends with it's a war bride ship um realizes that the the address that Margaret's husband has given her is a fake address mm. that it was number seven the domain Sydney and the domain of course is where the governor's house is yeah so there is no number seven the domain and on that ship she, Margaret realizes that her husband probably was already married and that he's just lied to her and I thought oh that is a great opening for a story <laughs> <laughs> And that's basically what happens to Margaret in The War Bride. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and finds, you know, but it's more complicated than that. Yeah. Because, in fact, there was a change of ship, and this really did happen. The Waimana ship was so disgusting that the women refused to go on it and they were changed to the border. And in my story, her husband hasn't lied to her, but he gets the information about the first ship but doesn't get the information about the second. Oh. And so he turns up at the docks and she's not there. Oh, right. He thinks that she has not, um, that she's not come. And so they both go on to, and this all happens in the first chapter, so I'm not giving you any spoilers. <laughs> but, um, they both go on to create new lives and then find out that they're actually still married. Wow. So um, that, and that's based on reality too. There was a huge number of divorces in the past, uh, the First World War. Mm. Um, and a lot of bigamy cases. Yes. So in one week in Melbourne in 1923, there were 33 bigamy cases coming oh, out of World War I. Oh, wow. A lot of it was just that divorce was so expensive. Yeah, right. And very hard for women to get. Like it was very, very much slanted towards the man's decision mm -hmm. whether or not the divorce went through. Yeah. And it cost something like as a minimum, four or five months salary oh. to get a divorce. Wow. So in a time when, you know, a tradesman would be earning four pounds a week, mm -hmm. the minimum it would cost was about 50 pounds. Yeah. So <clears throat> most people didn't bother. Yeah. And <laughs> big cases were brought mainly to make the husband pay for children. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Gosh. Yeah. So what was this, what was after that? Did you stick with World well, War II? Or? <laughs> World War I. Yeah, World War I, yep. um, I went abroad. So yep. this is a letter from Italy I'm showing you now. And, yep. and it's um, while I was doing that research for The Soldier's Wife and War Bride, I kept reading these extraordinary women's page editorials, which were incredibly feminist, mm. you know. Uh, and it turned out that... Um, they were being written by a woman called Louisa Mack, who was the first woman war correspondent. Uh, she actually reported from behind enemy lines on the German invasion of Belgium in World War I. Mm. And that inspired me to write a story about a woman war correspondent it's, in Italy. Yeah. So so that's it's very much a kind of woman battling the system because women weren't allowed to come into press conferences. Mm in World War One, And so my girl, Rebecca, has to set up an alliance with a photographer, uh, Sandro Baker. And, um, uh, and of course, she's, she's married. So it all gets very complicated. Oh, excellent. <laughs> do, do love complicated love twists. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to make it hard for them, you know. You've got to make it hard for, you, for your character. <laughs> you do, absolutely. <laughs> So tell us about researching these stories. Do you get to go to some interesting places? Oh, no. Well, <laughs> um, Sydney ones, you know, I got to go to North Sydney. In one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes I'm drawing on past travel, like in a letter from Italy, I've been to, to Italy, I've been to Venice, which is where the last part of it is set. Um, but... Not so much, mm. although at the moment I'm working on uh, a book set in London in the 1920s and I 
did go to London recently um, to uh, as part of something else and did some fantastically interesting research there. So sometimes. Yeah. Um, but for the current book, which is uh, The Desert Nurse, which I'm showing to you, um, that's set in predominantly in Egypt. And, no, I didn't get to go there. I put in a grant application, but, alas, I did not get the grant. Oh. <laughs> So yeah, you better tell us about that one, that um, the desert nurse. So what mm. what's the story behind that one? Well, it goes back to the soldier's wife. Yep. Um, as I said, my grandfather almost died, mm. and he almost died and was saved by good nursing. Yep. So the doctors had done with him; they they'd done their operations, and um, and it was down to the nurses to get him through that fever, mm. and they did. You know, and so when I was writing The Soldier's Wife, we didn't go to Egypt in that book. It's all set in Sydney. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to write a book about those nurses one day. I wanted to, to honour their contribution um, and their service. And so that, that's what The Desert Nurse is from. Uh, this, And, in fact, the characters in The Soldier's Wife, Jimmy and Arthur Freeman, who is my grandfather, mm. um, they come back. In this, and we see the other side of their story. We see them being saved um, in the hospital. Oh. Uh, so it's, just, it's a small part of the story, but I was really keen to put it in there. Yeah. Um, and so we find out a lot about what happened to other people. In a letter from Italy, the main character's brother goes missing in uh, Palestine, and we find out what happens to him in this book as well. He's a major character. Oh. Um, so it's kind of like bringing a lot of the threads of the earlier books together, mm. but it's mainly about these extraordinary women um, who they they volunteered almost immediately. As soon as war was declared, you had this rush of nurses um, because they understood that they would be needed. Mm. Uh, and the other character, so the, the main character is Evelyn Northey, and she wants to be a doctor. But her father, although a doctor and although she's been acting as his practice nurse for some years, he doesn't believe that women should be doctors, which is a very common belief at that time. Yeah. And um, so he withholds her inheritance until she's 30. And in the meantime, she thinks, all right, well, I've got to make a living, so I'll become a nurse. Yeah. And um, she's, you know, all her sights are set on being a doctor. And then as with so many other people, the war intervenes. Mm. And she puts her medical skills to use saving people's lives. Yeah. And then the other character is William Brent, um, who is a doctor who can't get into the army because he had polio as a child and so he doesn't measure up, you know, but mm. he wants to help. And so he turns up in Egypt at the time when all of the casualties from Gallipoli are arriving mm. and he begins to help. And they need doctors so much that, that they welcome him gladly. Mm. And neither of them are interested in marriage. So Evelyn does, doesn't does ever want a man to have control over her life. Mm. Um, and once you married in those days, basically your husband had control over you and owned everything you owned. So her inheritance would come under his control. Mm. And so she's determined never to get involved. And William doesn't think he's fit to marry because he knows it's possible he will deteriorate as he gets older yeah, and he won't be able to support a wife and family. So you have these two people who are drawn together, both of whom believe that they shouldn't marry yeah. and shouldn't love even. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm just remembering watching Anzac Girls a couple of years ago yeah. when it first came out and I just yeah. I loved that. Yeah. And well, some of those people are in this book. Yeah, so right. It's Ross King, Connie Keys, people like that. Yeah. Um, uh, they are in the book because they were they were nursing in Cairo, yeah. in the first Australian General Hospital, Heliopolis Palace. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they were extraordinary women. Yeah. Um, and and I'd like to put in real people, you know, where where I can mm. to just to pay tribute to those. Yeah, yeah, we've had some absolutely fantastic people um, mm. in the history. So, well, so that's awesome. Um, so in your spare time, <laughs> um, you also do some teaching for the Australian Writers' Centre. Yes, I do. Yeah, so I'm um, Director of Creative Writing there, which means that I oversee the kind of um, what I think of as the vanilla courses, the ones that are not about any particular genre. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we have a range of courses going from absolute beginners courses like Creative Writing Stage 1 through to a six-month novel writing course. Um, and we, we're getting fantastic results from our students. One of my students has a major book coming out with um, Penguin Random House next month. I have to put in a little plug for that, Margaret Morgan's The Second Cure. Excellent. Fantastic book. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you liked Charlotte Wood's The Natural Way of Things or The Handmaid's Tale, it's that kind of book. Mm. Um, very challenging, quite in, but fabulous read, like just a fantastic read and great characters. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we take people from not ever having written anything through to publication if they have the skill and the determination, which is what you really need. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the Australian Writers Centre, I think, have just started doing some courses, um, face-to-face courses out of Brisbane. Um, That's right. Yeah, and yep. I, I know they do them in Sydney, which is where you're based. And um, Melbourne and Perth. And Mel- I think we're starting in Canberra. Oh, well. excellent. And I know um, when I was living in Townsville, I um, organised for Natasha Lester to do the How to Write a Bestseller course yeah. up yeah, there through great. AWC. So, yeah, it is that, that was an absolutely fantastic uh, course. I'd also, mm-hmm. also like to say that we have maybe 80% of our courses are online. Yes. So we have actually more students online than we do face-to-face. Yeah, and the courses are great. I, I have personally done a couple too, so they are, yeah, really well worth it. Yeah, and we have people from all over the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I currently have students online from one from Utah, one from Switzerland. Um, yeah, so we get people from all over, which yeah. is lovely. It's great to have all those viewpoints coming into the class. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, of course, the um, the lovely ladies, um, Valerie and... Um, Al, Alison Tate um, yes, run the yes. uh, So You Want to Be a Writer podcast. Yeah, yep. it's fantastic. Yeah, it is fantastic. Um, I might I might just say we've got a new course we're just about to start, mm. which is an eight-week novel writing essentials course, and it's for designed for people who have an idea for a story or maybe have just started it but um, they don't really know how to write a book. Yeah. You know, like yeah. they write scenes maybe you know it's re- it's really hard to make that transition from an idea yeah. to a whole book and this i this course the idea is to kind of hold your hand through that transition yeah. um and and push you out the other end with maybe 20,000 words written yeah so i'm i'm teaching that face to face soon but we'll also be putting it online by the end of the year yeah that that's an excellent idea i i do meet a lot of young wannabe authors and they go yeah oh yeah and i'll just start writing but they really have no idea and they just get stuck exactly yeah yeah exactly and the, and this course is designed both for the people who haven't started and for the people who are stuck yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i'm really excited about it actually i think it'll be it'll it will really fill a hole there yeah. um, for a lot of people. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. I think that's a great idea. So we were saying before, you just kind of collect some awards along, <laughs> along the way. That's right. This is my hobby is collecting awards. That's right. yeah. I love that. <laughs> so tell us about some of the ones you've collected over the years. Uh, well, I guess the first one was the, the historical fiction um, the New South Wales Premier's Award for Historical Fiction for The Black Dress. Um, and that's a particularly nice one because it comes with money. Hey. Not, not <laughs> many awards come with money. I, that one retired my bathroom, which was excellent. <laughs> <That's> wonderful. Um, <laughs> um, and then I've won a couple of Aurealis Awards, which are for uh, speculative fiction. Um, Ember and Ash won the best fantasy novel. And one of my children's books, Victor's Challenge, won the best children's fantasy. Um, And then my most recent uh, children's picture book, I I I tend to write non-fiction picture books, Mm -hmm. um, which I love doing. And this was about Lake Eyre. It's called Desert Lake. And it won the ASO Librarian's Choice Award and got shortlisted for, I think, four or five other awards as well. And I don't take any credit for that because the illustrations are yeah. unbelievable. They yeah. just absolutely wonderful. Liz and Nelly is the illustrator. And I'm really happy to say I'm working on another book with her about Kakadu. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, which was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, you know, that 
those are the four. And then I've been shortlisted for just about everything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because you don't necessarily know. Like with the the War Bride, for example, mm -hmm. the War Bride was shortlisted for Best Romantic Novel in both Australia and the UK. Yeah. And at that point I went, oh, I didn't know I was writing romance. <laughs> 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 because I... You know, The Soldier's Wife is not really a romance at all. Yeah. Um, and then War Bride came out. I mean, it is a romance in the sense that it's about two people who love each other and, and it's about their relationship and where they go. But it's not a romance in the classical sense. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, they're already married at the beginning of the book. Yeah. Um, so, so when I started writing The War Bride, I wasn't really thinking of it as writing a romance. And then I got shortlisted for these prizes and I went, Okay, yes, I'm a robot. So absolutely, I'm right there on that. Um, uh, so sometimes you do things and you don't even know what you're doing. Yeah. You know, you just write the story. Yeah. Um, and and things get shortlisted for weird awards, like well, not weird. I mean, very good awards, but awards yeah. you don't ex awards you don't expect, like the Speech Pathology Award <laughs> or the Wilderness Society Environment Award. And you you don't go out writing a book for that yeah. but it's lovely if you get shortlisted yeah absolutely so what's out next and what are you working on well um the the you know this one the um there's a nurse is just out yeah um my next children's book i'm very excited about and those of you who are interested in historical fiction i'm hoping you'll like this too this is called amazing australian women and it's about 12 historical women in australia who were just extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and it's it's aimed at primary school students. Um, and I would urge, if you, you're looking for a present for a child, it's a great present, and particularly for boys. Oh. Right? Because people look at it and go, oh, I must get my daughter, you know, grandson, what, sorry, granddaughter or, or great niece or whatever, a copy. But it's the boys as well who need to read about the amazing women, yep. you know. Girls know that women can be amazing. <laughs> um, and, yes, they need a bit of encouragement. But um, uh, I think it's a great present for boys too. Yeah. Um, and there will be some women in there that your your listeners will know, like um, Nellie Melba or Annette Kellerman maybe they might know or Sister Kenny, Mary Reby. But then there are people that you definitely won't know about, like Tara Nora, who was uh, an Indigenous, a Palawa woman from Tasmania who was the main leader of the resistance to invasion in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. She was extraordinary. Um, people like Tilly Aston, who was the first blind teacher in Australia and started Vision Australia. Um and Laurie Bonney, who's my favourite, who um, was one of the early aviators. She was the first woman to fly from Australia to London. She was the first person to fly from Australia to South Africa. Wow. And nobody's ever heard of her. No. You know, we all know about Amelia Earhart, but nobody's heard of Laurie Bonney, who actually was a better pilot because <laughs> she always got home. Exactly. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, in fact, flew far further than Amelia Earhart ever did. Wow. Um, and yeah, I'd love to see people know more about her. Yeah. So you know, it's a, it's um we've got um people like Rose Kwong, who uh, was a lecturer in Chinese Chinese philosophy and culture, mm. trying to bring Western and Chinese cultures closer together uh, on the world stage. Mm. Um, amazing, just amazing women. You know, really extraordinary. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for that. And we've all learned so much today. And we, we know if we want to learn and and uh, do some more courses and enhance our writing skills, we should go to the yeah. Australian Writers' Centre. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I do love teaching. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, awesome. I love taking people from where they are and, and increasing their skills so they can achieve what they want to do. Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. So where can we find you online, Pamela? Um, Pamela-Hart.com and be careful of the hyphen, put that in because PamelaHart.com is an African-American jazz singer from Austin, Texas. <laughs> um, <laughs> lovely woman. <laughs> so Pamela-Hart.com and I'm on Facebook um, and on Twitter as Pamela Hart Books um, and on Pinterest also, although not so much. Yeah. Um, 
Pamela Freeman on Facebook as well, Pamela Freeman author, but my P Pamela Hart page is there. It's probably the best way to contact me there. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for chatting to us today, Pamela. That was great. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Jump onto my website, sarahwilliamsauthor.com and join my mailing list to receive a free preview of my books and lots of other inspiration. If you like the show and want it to continue, you can become a sponsor for just a couple of dollars a month. Go to patreon.com forward slash sarahwilliamsauthor and remember to follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and leave a review of the podcast. I'll be back next week with another loved up episode. Bye.